American leadership right now has never been more vital, uh, at least in my lifetime. I think we see a moment of great disruptions around the world, the kind of disruptions that previously have led to world wars, frankly. We see great disruptions in the economy. Um, we see uh, very exciting disruptions in traditional hierarchies, whether that's of gender, race, uh, region, and post-colonial dynamics. We see rising powers and declining powers. Uh, we see the impacts of climate change. We see the technological disruptions, uh, both of the information landscape and also um, uh, of the uh, jobs landscape. Uh, when we think about how much the globalization era, the NAFTA era, created ripples in the United States that we still see today politically, most of the painful disruptions of globalization in terms of job loss in the United States were focused in a limited number of sectors of the economy and a limited number of regions in terms of the, the most intense losses. Um, and yet we still see that rippling uh, a generation later. Automation is going to affect every region, uh, every sector of the economy, every level of skills employment. So when we think about these issues of, of um, a very changing landscape, um, that can be a very exciting moment. We can reimagine the world, but we also can see that being preyed on the insecurity um, to create wars, create division, create uh, strongman politics over inclusive democracy. So this is a time where America's role in the world has changed. We have a lot of credibility to rebuild, um, but it's also a time where it's important. And I think one great example of this right now is the opportunity for the Biden administration to go bold on vaccine diplomacy. At the end of the day, it's a great example that the United States still sets the gold standard for the world and that our power doesn't have to be at the expense of others. In fact, it can be something that raises the standards of others. At the end of the day, we are the country that discovered the gold standard vaccines. We are manufacturing it and we're in a position to distribute it um, and distribute it in a way uh, that actually saves lives around the world, creates resilience around the world for future pandemics um, and shows the world that unlike some countries, we're not trying to rise at the expense of keeping others down. We're not trying to make sure our domestic growth plan uh, means taking the minerals or other things from their uh, countries. We can show the basic concept of collective security that came out of the greatest generation from World War II. When I think about my lifetime and the fall of the Berlin Wall at that moment versus uh, Arab Spring, in the fall of Berlin Wall, the United States was the gold standard of the middle class, of an inclusive middle class, of a land of opportunity. And that meant that people associated both the market dynamics of that with the core ideas of liberalism, of human rights and democracy and created that period uh, in which that was in ascendance. When I was in Egypt during Arab Spring and going throughout that region at that time, people didn't associate the United States with that. They saw it associated with fragility after the economic crash, with great inequality, with a declining middle class. And that had huge negative implications for people's association with the basic liberal notions of human rights and democracy. I was surprised how much the notion of the 99% caught on during that year and my interviews uh, throughout the Middle East. So when our middle class at home is weak, when our commitment to racial equality is weak, when we are, to, are restricting voting rights instead of at the cutting edge of how to uh, have a more inclusive universal voting system. All of those things make our power and our ideas around the world weaker. So at this time, we have an opportunity with things like vaccine diplomacy to go bold. We have an opportunity with rebuilding uh, a more inclusive and secure middle class and addressing these long structural problems like the limits that we've put on democracy in order to rebuild the kind of vision that when the wall came down, everyone wanted to be like that, like our system that we didn't have around the world in 2011. But I think we can rebuild it again. And I think we continue to be the most resilient and innovative people around the world. And I think that global leadership has to be one in which we don't see a trade-off between the dynamics at home and abroad. We understand that from our trade policy uh, to our uh, public health policies, that a strong, resilient public, uh, middle class at home is part of a good foreign policy abroad, and that we are offering a very different approach to power and leadership than China and other emerging powers. So I think this is a great opportunity. 
uh, for the Biden administration to go big on COVID. And also I think what they've set out with the foreign policy of the middle class, that's very jarring for the ears of many foreign policy experts, actually makes a great deal of sense for getting back to these core notions of human rights and democracy in their appeal. And I hope the panel today will discuss that more. Hello, everyone. My name is Pardis Madavi, and I am the Dean of Social Sciences here at Arizona State University. And I want to welcome you to the McCain Institute's Sedona Forum. I want to extend a very special welcome today to our three senators who have joined us. Welcome to Senator Mitt Romney from Utah. Welcome to Senator Chris Coons from Delaware. And welcome to Senator Shaheen from New Hampshire. Thank you so much for being with us today. We're just going to jump right in with the first question. And I'll let uh, whomever wants to take the first pass at it, go right ahead and do that. Um, I will try to keep us moving. I have four questions for you all and a couple of other standby ones. So I will try to keep us moving. I'm very excited to hear your thoughts on this important topic. So first, as the 21st century advances, does the United States need to retain dominance in particular regions of the world or specific areas of production? If so, what are they? And what specifically can the U.S. do in terms of foreign policy to achieve these goals? You know, one of my lessons, having served on the Foreign Relations Committee since 2009, since I got to the Senate, has been that if America leaves the playing field, no matter where it is around the world, that we can expect that vacuum to be filled and usually by our adversaries, not by our friends. So I don't think it's as much a case of are there areas where we need to maintain dominance. I think it's more about are we continuing to work with our allies? Are we continuing, continuing to address hot spots around the world and issues that become problems either for the country um, themselves or for um, the rest of the globe? So I, I think um, our foreign policy is really based on promoting democracy where we can and helping um, other countries to get to that point and sharing the values that we have here at home. Senator Coons. Uh, thank you, Mitt. Um, great to be on with you with Senator Sheen, Senator Romney, uh, and my thanks uh, to the McCain Institute for the opportunity to join you again. I look forward uh, to this uh, annual seminar being in Sedona once again, hopefully next year. Um, I, I would agree that we need to be engaged in the world or we'll suffer the consequences of our absence. Uh, but the framing of the question as to whether or not we need to dominate certain technologies or regions, I'll, I'll push back on. I think we need to stay engaged and to make significant investments and to work closely with our partners to retain our competitive advantage. Uh, and I'll just mention two or three areas I think are currently critical. Um, we withdrew from the Paris Climate Agreement and from the World Health Organization in recent years, and the new administration has rejoined them. Um, I think that's important. I think it's important for us to be global leaders in public health, in combating this pandemic, and in helping the developing world in particular um, confront significant disease challenges where the United States has a well-deserved record across administrations, both Republican and Democrat, for being uh, at the leading edge of combating diseases from HIV AIDS to malaria from Ebola to now COVID-19. And I think that's important. I think it's beneficial to how we're seen by the world um, and to how we show our values and uh, our engagement on a humanitarian level. Um, I also think the existential threat of climate change um, demands of us that we continue to invest in innovation in developing and deploying new technologies, not just here in the United States, but globally. Um, as I've discussed with Senators Romney and Shaheen in other settings, if the United States manages to make breakthrough developments in things like um, grid scale storage or electric vehicles um, in power generation or in um, how we decarbonize the production of things like uh, concrete or steel, um, we can export those technologies globally and not just help our climate, uh, but help our economy and our country. So there's lots of opportunities where we should still be leading the world and where frankly we can't take a back seat to anyone else but i don't mean to imply that i think we should dominate rather that we should continue to partner with our allies and retain our competitive advantage thank you dean i guess it's my turn and i i wanted to hear from my colleagues because i want to underscore that that on this topic and i think on most topics related to foreign policy 
Republicans and Democrats see eye to eye. I, I don't disagree with anything I heard from uh, either Governor Senator Shaheen or from Senator uh, Coons. Uh, we, we see eye to eye on these things. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that America needs to dominate, but I do believe uh, that we need to continue the commitment we've made since after the Second World War, which is to assure, to assure for instance, the, the freedom of the seas, the freedom in the sky and the freedom in space. And that we don't want to see another other, other nation or group of nations decide that uh, you can't go through a certain ocean or through a certain sea without paying a toll to them. We've, we've maintained that. I think we have a commitment to continue to do so. Likewise, I think we feel it's very important to have rules of trade around the world and that countries abide by those rules. I think we're going to probably have rules as they relate to the environment and the pollution of our environment with greenhouse gases. I think those are things where, where we can play a leadership role. I, I would note that I, I also think that the one place I hope we lead in is, is in our commitment and promotion of human rights and human dignity. China is going to spend a, a trillion dollars uh, on their Belt and Road Initiative. It's, a, if you will, a form of Chinese colonialism. It's, we've seen this, this, uh, uh, this movie before, and it doesn't end well for countries that played colonial powers in the past. Uh, but, uh, but that's what they're going to be doing. And I think the way we combat that is not by trying to take a trillion dollars ourselves and, and, and copy them, but instead communicating the importance of values, the values of democracy and freedom, uh, the values of dignity for men and for women, uh, the, the values of, of respecting people regardless of our ethnic differences. Uh, these things I think we must lead in to communicate to the people of the world what it means to be a, a part of a group of nations that abide by not authoritarianism, but by freedom. So if there were anything I, I would hope that we continue to lead in as, as we remain involved in the world, it is in promoting uh, the values that have been at the foundation of America from our founding. Thank you so much, Senators. Um, to follow up on that question, and actually to follow up on, on your answer, uh, Senator Coons, um, if anything that last year has taught us, it's that we face a very uncertain and dangerous world. Some people have talked about this past year in terms of a triple pandemic. We have a viral pandemic of COVID-19 that is raging. We have a pandemic of climate emergencies and people talk about the social pandemic of racism. So a triple threat, if you will. What is the most important change we can make now to ensure that the United States is prepared for the next major crisis and can play a strong role in global leadership of some of the world's most wicked problems like those that we have been seeing in the last year? Well, I think we need to be honest with ourselves about some of the challenges our democracy is facing. Um, the riot at the Capitol on January 6th showed us some of the very real risks to our own democracy that come from uh, the dissemination of uh, misinformation. Um, and the ways in which we have a divided country where not everybody um, agrees with some of the core tenets of our democracy. So we've got some work to do. Um, the nationwide protests uh, following the brutal murder of George Floyd um, also shows us that we've got some long unaddressed racial inequalities and racial disparities that we need to look hard at and to resolve. We're not going to be the sort of strong leading light of human rights and democracy around the world that we all want us to be, that we should be, that I think the world needs us to be if we don't look honestly at our own shortcomings and address them. Um, we've got some inspiring work going on on the Foreign Relations Committee and on other committees um, to pull together and to reinvest in American civics education, American innovation and manufacturing, things that make America more competitive. Um, and we've got hard work to do in our own communities and families and uh, neighborhoods to make sure that people actually listen to each other more and respect each other more. In the Senate, in the decade that I've been there, uh, we have steadily struggled more and more to get genuinely bipartisan bills moving during periods when both parties have been in control and we've had presidents of both parties. We need to show that democracy can work again. So in my view, you know, it, there is no fundamental flaw um, in America's structure, in our uh, founding documents or in our aspirations. Um, but we need to refresh and renew our commitment to human rights, our commitment to each other, and our ability and willingness to solve the real daily problems facing the American people if we're going to get out of this pandemic, if we're going to get through this recession, if we're going to confront climate change together, and if we're going to address our racial inequalities. If we do those things, then we lay the foundation for the United States in this century um, to be the sort of 
um, vanguard of human rights and democracy, um, the advocate and the um, successful advocate for um, freedom and for individual liberty that I think all of us would like to see us be in this century. I'll be happy to jump in there and, 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 just, and just to say, I, again, I concur with what Senator Kuhn just said. I, I note a couple of things. If you look at, at other great nations or even civilizations over the history of humankind that have faced extraordinary challenges, those that have come through those challenges have often been led by individuals of extraordinary capability, extraordinary leaders. Uh, who who uh, communicated with the with the people of their nation or their or their or their civilization in such a way that they they created unity and 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 common purpose and I, I you know I think of a Churchill uh, I think of our in our own case uh, we were facing some tough times uh, President Reagan came along with a cheery optimism that gave us a different uh, a different spirit uh, you go through the history of the earth there have been individuals that have made a huge difference and I would note that's not just the person at the top. It's leaders throughout the entire civilization, leaders in classrooms, leaders in businesses, leaders in churches, leaders in homes. We call upon leaders to show by their own example, the principles that will, uh, that will keep us strong and free. And I know one of the principles that keeps us strong and free is our commitment to the truth. I think in dealing with the challenges that we face now and the challenges that are gonna come down the road, it is essential that we have a commitment to abide by the truth, that those that we select as leaders tell the truth when they make a mistake, acknowledge that something was, was wrong and correct it, but, but we, will, we will never be able to uh, 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 deal with our challenges unless we're honest with the people that we lead. And I certainly agree with my colleagues on in both of those aspects. I think as we think about those three big challenges that you outlined, we, have, we are likely not gonna solve them on our own as Americans. And that's why our relationships with other countries are so important. And why, as we think about addressing climate change, for example, getting back in the Paris Climate Accords, working with the international community to address that is so important, even when it comes to racial inequities. And um, the, it's not just the United States that's been struggling with that as we look at democratic backsliding across um, Europe and other parts of the world, as we look at the opposition to migration and to anyone who looks like who is the other, um, those are challenges that the world is facing. And it's important for us to think about tackling those in the context of not just the United States and being honest with what's happening here, but also in terms of world forums where we can, we can work with our allies and try and solve the big challenges that we all face. Thank you so much for that. And, and building off of your, all three of your answers, I mean, it's, it's, it's great to hear you talking about human rights and leadership. Um, recently, the Biden administration joined Sweden and our neighbors to the north and south, Canada and Mexico, in committing to what is called a feminist foreign policy. This is an area that I, of course, work on quite a bit, so I'm very excited to hear your thoughts. What are your thoughts on the, our commitment, the United States' commitment to engage in a feminist foreign policy, and how can the U.S. continue to lead in this important area? Well, look, I find it a little bit offensive that when we're talking about half of the world's population, we make a point of calling it a feminist foreign policy. Our foreign policy should always include um, women. Um, and that's not just um, important because it's the right thing to do, but it makes sense because what we know is that when women are empowered around the world, that they contribute more to their communities, that Societies that have empowered women are more stable and have um, generally a higher standard of living. It makes economic sense. It makes sense from the human rights perspective. And it's something that the United States should, be, should have been doing from day one in terms of our foreign policy. And some administrations have been better than others. Um, so I'm, I appreciate the commitment. I think it's really important. I think we need an Office of Global Women's Issues and an ambassador to fill that office. But 
it should be about everything we do. We should be looking at um, what, what women are doing and how we can include women in those foreign policies and in other initiatives that we have. You know, I, I was proud to sponsor the Women, Peace and Security Act that was signed into law in 2017. We were the first country to actually legislatively say that women should be involved at the table in conflict negotiations, um, that it makes sense because those any settlements last longer and provide more stability. So there are a lot of reasons why it makes sense for us to include um, women as part of our foreign policy. And again, I, I think calling it the feminization of foreign policy, I have a little trouble with because that um, so to me talks down to what we should have been doing all along. I'll just note, uh, I, I, I'm not gonna disagree with, uh, with, with Senator Shaheen uh, and, uh, and I'm, I'm really not familiar with the, uh, the, the, uh, the application of feminization of foreign policy, but I, I, I can say that I think it's a, a wise uh, uh, observation uh, to recognize that, that nations that, that, and groups of people that do not have uh, women empowered are, are more likely to be involved in conflicts uh, and, and, uh, and economic uh, distress. Uh, and that having women fully educated and involved in the political system and the economic system establishes a more stable, peaceful, prosperous uh, people. Uh, and it's one of the things we've seen in, in a place like Afghanistan where, where I know there's much to be done there and it's not as, as satisfactory as I'm sure we would have hoped as we began our involvement there. But to see women being able to go to, to, to school and to college and to be involved in the political uh, setting of, of Afghanistan is, in my opinion, one of the most, if not the most encouraging aspect of what we've seen in Afghanistan. And, and, and hoping to see women be able to play a, a more prominent role in other nations where they do not now, um, uh, in my opinion, is nothing but good for the economic uh, and, and uh, the diplomatic and peaceful existence of that nation and that people. So uh, this is something we ought to be paying attention to. I, I don't know whether the term, uh, the feminization is meant to say that, but I think if we see a, a nation or an ally where women are being repressed, uh, I think we ought to say, hey, th this is something we ought to be aware of and we ought to see if we can't change this because to have a strong ally long ter term, we want, we want women and men to be equal in all possible ways. Uh, and, uh, and, and women participating in the economic and political uh, structure of, uh, of, of any country that's an ally and, and many that, that, are, that are even not. So yeah, I, I'm, uh, I, I think the, the intent is perhaps a, a good one, but I recognize this should have happened a long time ago. I'm reminded of something my dear friend Johnny Isaacson, a former senator from Georgia, once said when we were on a trip together uh, to a country in Africa, Johnny was a conservative Republican uh, from Georgia, still is a conservative Republican from Georgia. Uh, I'm a more liberal a Democrat from Delaware, um, but we traveled to more than a dozen countries together around the world. Um, and as we were leaving one particular place, he said, you know, if we have one extra dollar to invest in development, we should invest it in women because women turn around and invest it in clean water, in safer housing, in education, in healthcare, uh, no disrespect to my own gender, uh, but across different places we'd been in different programs we'd seen uh, in the country we'd just been to. Um, women were the, the builders and the movers of a society where uh, gender equality was still um, a, an objective, a goal, but far from a current reality. And where that marginal dollar uh, men tended to spend on um, projects that really benefited themselves. Uh, and did not benefit their children and did not benefit their broader community, uh, just speaking uh, in a fairly you know, coarse way across uh, two genders. And I think to take the point implicitly being made by Senator Shaheen and Senator Romney, uh, where I've interacted with heads of state uh, or secretaries of state or even ministers of defense, uh, women in leadership um, tend to be more collaborative, more oriented towards solutions, more oriented towards peacemaking, more concerned about things like climate change or healthcare, uh, men tend to be more aggressive, competitive, focused on the economy, on short term or on personal aggrandizement. And across interacting with dozens of 
ministers of state or secretaries of state, heads of state, it's been a striking pattern. Um, so if that is what is meant by the feminization of American foreign policy, that it would focus on gender equality uh, and focus on investments in healthcare and combating climate change in improving the environment and improving uh, daycare and education, things that should be of interest to all of us, male or female, um, that I'm certainly in favor of that. Thank you so much, Senators. And of course, a feminist foreign policy also brings with it feminist values. And you know, we have we're seeing today the birth of a new feminism, which many of us call justice feminism, right? It's a new feminism that's a move away from career or care focused feminism, and it's about justice feminism that tackles exactly those issues that that we've been talking about here today. So, you know, if, if that's going to be the root of U.S. foreign policy. Um, about time, as Senator Shaheen has, has, has articulated so powerfully. You know, Dean, let me just add another piece of this because it's been very, very frustrating as we think about um, the role of women, um, both in the United States and around the world, that in so much of our legislation, what has gotten hung up has been the issue of reproductive rights. And we can't conflate every issue affecting women with access to reproductive freedom, or it's gonna really constrain other opportunities to empower women economically in terms of their rightful place in their society. So it's been to me, one of the most frustrating aspects of what we've seen in the last couple of decades. Thank you so much for that. And, uh, you know, that's definitely something that has been echoing throughout the feminist movements as we've seen this, you know, the birth of justice feminism saying that it's not just about reproductive justice, but really that it's about justice writ large and things like climate justice and health justice and, you know, social justice are all kind of rolled into this, um, taking it to a transnational level. So, um, Definitely a lot of resonance with what you're, you're saying, Senator Shaheen. To slightly shift gears, uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, what we hear quite a lot and we have for, for generations, decades. Uh, I'm an anthropologist by training, so we've been hearing it at least as long as I've been you know, a, a student. But within the United States, it's common to hear about how our nation is exceptional and distinct, even number one. You see that in reports like the Trafficking in Persons report, human rights reports, et cetera. To what degree is the future of our country's global leadership harmed by the popular embrace of US exceptionalism? And what should the US foreign policy posture be on that issue? Well, I'm gonna lead off because I haven't led off so far and it's not fair for me to keep on relying on my colleagues to say something right. smart and then me to say, yeah, me too. Uh, I, I can tell you, I, I, don't, I, I, I don't think it hurts uh, for us to be uh, uh, very patriotic in that regard and to, and to call ourselves exceptional amongst ourselves and to, and to cheer ourselves, whether at the Olympics or to cheer our, our, our successes uh, where, they, where they might occur. But, but I think we recognize that other nations also feel they're, they're number one uh, and they're entitled to feel that way and, and they're exceptional in their own way. We're each different. Uh, uh, and, and I happen to believe that, that this is an exceptional nation. Uh, and that the, in the sense that that uh, the founders uh, had this extraordinarily brilliant insight that a nation ruled of by and for the people uh, would be a stronger and better nation than one ruled by an, an all-knowing uh, autocrat of some kind. And and the history of the world was, of course, uh, strong men, and and unfortunately just men, but strong men that oppressed others and took advantage of others for their own personal benefit. And and America was was began with a different model. And, and that model has been extraordinarily successful and has been adopted by many other places in the world. And so, yeah, the, the founders uh, deserve a lot of credit for the brilliance in creating what they, what they created here. And, and, and we live uh, in, in many ways in uh, accepting those principles. In some ways we have abandoned some. Uh, and as has been pointed out many times, we are not the perfect union. We are striving to become a more perfect union. There are many elements that we have not lived up to in our founding documents, and and there's a, a much that we have to do. I, I think it probably is unfortunate that that today, the, the storming of the Capitol on January sixth, that will be used against us. People will say, "Oh, that's the American model." Uh, likewise, the, the racism that that exists in our country, uh, that will be used against us. And it says uh, to the world, "You may call yourself exceptional, but not in the way you think." 
And I, I, you know, I, I would note that this comes at a very critical time because we are now in a, in a competition in the world for whether freedom and human rights will win or whether instead authoritarianism and repression and the lack of freedom will win. And so far over the last 15 years, the Freedom House says we're losing. The authoritarianism is, authoritarianism is winning and China and Russia are promoting a very di different model. So uh, I think it's incumbent on us not to go around cheering, hey, we're, you know, we're number one, we're number one, uh, particularly when we've, we've been losing for the last 15 years in our global effort and it concentrated instead on making our, our own house better and at the same time promoting values that we think can help the, the people of the world have more happiness, more freedom, and more prosperity. I, I think that was very well said, Mitt. And um, I think exceptionalism, we all, hopefully all of us as individuals also feel exceptional because we want everybody to recognize their individual um, specialness, but exceptionalism shouldn't mean going it alone. And I think for too much of the last few years, that's what exceptionalism has come to mean for some people. Um, and again, what we need to do is, because the challenges that we're facing are big, as we're thinking about our foreign policy, I think it's really important to recognize that we're most successful when we work with our allies. And even when we work with um, those people who are not our friends sometimes, but the, the best way we can promote American values, the best way we can um, help address conflicts around the world, um, help empower people and fight human rights is working with our allies and working with the international community. And I think for the last few years, that piece has been lost for a lot of people. If I can just echo what my um, colleagues and friends have said, um, what I think is exceptional about the United States uh, isn't our unique geography, the fact that we were protected by two oceans or uh, the blessings of uh, remarkable natural resources that our country's endowed with, or even the makeup of uh, where our people came from. It is the values that were enshrined by our framers in our founding documents. And um, I think what has made the United States a country admired uh, around the world and a country that has encouraged people struggling for greater human rights or greater participation in their democracy for greater individual liberty or for greater opportunity. Uh, whether they're in Burma or Myanmar, in Belarus, in Ethiopia, uh, or in Russia, or in China, I think around the world, people have looked to the United States, not because we're perfect. Um, obviously, uh, the last year has demonstrated uh, more clearly than any year in my life that we have our flaws and our challenges but that there are underlying values, our aspirational goals are exceptional because they're universal. They appeal to people of every background in every country. There are people desperately trying to get into this country, unlike Russia or China. And there are people who admire us when we're at our best. And so we need to be honest about when we're at our worst um, and hold ourselves accountable for actually being exceptional. Um, and as Jean just said, it, it's when we partner with like-minded countries that share those values, those universal values, um, that we have our greatest impact. Uh, and as Mitt just said, forgive me, Senator Shaheen and Senator Romney, um, it, it is when we recognize uh, and are transparent about our own uh, flaws, the ways in which we are becoming a more perfect union, um, that we can be at our best. Um, and it's when we continue um, to work in partnership with others around the world, whether individually uh, or as nations to advocate for democracy, for human rights, for free and open societies, for market economies, um, that we've got the opportunity um, to share that exceptionalism with the rest of the world. And you know, Dean, as, as we Dean. saw in the discussion with um, China and Secretary Blinken, um, mm -hmm. one of the things that Secretary Blinken reminded China when China, um, when the um, Foreign Minister of China was talking about um, the challenges that we have here at home as Mitt um, so eloquently described is that we appreciate that we have shortcomings and we're working on that. We are transparent about that. We are trying to make sure that we do something about it. And what we see in authoritarian countries is that they don't admit those challenges and they are not trying to work on those. And 
again, that's part of our values. One of the things that makes America different than those authoritarian countries who are our competitors. I was just going to note that, that uh, as I think about what I hope the world thinks of when they think about America and exceptionalism, they think about John McCain, um, a person who was uh, in a uh, Vietnamese uh, uh, prison, uh, tortured brutally for years upon years, and then some years later, as a United States Senator comes back to the same country and embraces people and shares the, the message of freedom. This is what makes, I think, our country so uh, so special. It's people like that. And uh, I, I know this is a, this is a forum that's uh, in many respects devoted to, to his memory. I hope we don't forget that as we think about this, uh, this great cause we're about. I, I have to leave you now. I apologize. But, thank you uh, so much, Senator Romney. And thank you for uh, uh, honoring uh, Senator McCain's memory and reminding us why we're all here having this important conversation. I want to thank you so much for your time uh, and, and wish you all the best. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Yeah. Safe travels. Safe travels. All right. Well, we're, we're going to continue on here and, and, and have just a couple more conversations. Um, I want to talk a little bit about a recent article that came out in The Nation by Karen Greenberg, where she and others have called on the Biden administration to end these endless wars. Um, and one of the, the issues that she and others have been addressing, and my colleague Daniel Rothenberg, also here at the Sedona Forum, has, has been addressing as well, is this question of the authorization of, of, milit of the use of military force, the AUMF. And I wanted to hear your thoughts, Senators, on um, what, what you think we should be doing with regards to the AUMF uh, and which movements we should be going in um, with regards to ending some of these, quote, endless wars, such as the war on terror. Well, even if we get rid of the AUMF that we, um, that Congress voted on in, I think 2001, before the um, going into Iraq, I don't think that ends the war on terror. And that's the frustrating thing. And I, I agree, I think we ought to repeal that AUMF because it, it opens the door to a lot of other potential conflict. But I think I was a, a chief executive, um, the governor of New Hampshire before I was a Senator. And um, having been on both sides, both the legislative side and the executive side, I think we need to be very thoughtful about how we, um, address the authorization for the president to take action. Um, one, of, one of the challenges I think that President Obama encountered when he drew a red line in Syria and said, if they use chemical weapons, um, I'm gonna take action. And then he decided he needed to go to Congress and it was very clear because of the partisan divide in Congress that there wasn't gonna be support for taking that action. And I think that created a whole series of dominoes in his foreign policy throughout the rest of his administration that were very challenging for him and for the United States. So I don't think it's as easy as saying, oh yeah, we're going to get rid of the AUMF because Congress needs to approve every um, military action that the president takes. Unfortunately, the world has changed dramatically um, since the War Powers Act back in when we were in Vietnam. And I, I think we've got to We've got to really think about how we would craft something. Now, having said that, I am encouraged that the administration is um, talking to some of the members of the Foreign Relations Committee about this issue. I have not been part of those discussions, but they, I think they are um, important and I understand they're progressing and hopefully we will be able to reach some agreement. On the War Powers Act and the AUMF point, Dean, I remind my colleagues often um, that we are in an unusual moment in that uh, President Biden, uh, of all the presidents uh, in the last 50 years, um, has the most respect for and awareness of the significance of the Senate and its structural role under our constitutional order. Um, president after president of both parties uh, has gradually accumulated more power 
uh, as the Senate has largely failed to act in any decisive way on national security and foreign policy issues, there is a give and take there. And um, I think we have a president who is looking to us to act as the Senate and to take initiative. And I think um, whatever you think of our ongoing engagements in Afghanistan, Syria, Iraq, and a dozen other countries, it is certainly true um, that even those senators who voted for the 02 and 01 um, authorizations, uh, the ones that launched the so-called war on terror and that authorized the invasion of Iraq, very few senators who are left voted for those two, um, probably no more than two dozen at this point. None of them could have imagined that 20 years later, we'd still be operating under those authorizations. So at a time when the Biden administration is carefully considering under what conditions and on what timeline um, they might complete a withdrawal from Afghanistan by the United States and its allied forces, um, I, I think we should also be having a careful conversation about um, what do we see as the ongoing uh, conflict uh, with extremism in the world. Uh, there are dangerous places in the world. There are folks who are looking to attack Americans and American interests uh, and who put real pressure on our partners and allies around the world. So to the point Senator Shaheen made earlier, um, just getting rid of an AOMF doesn't get rid of the um, insecurity and instability in the world. Um, I will remind you in closing just to criticize you know, myself as an appropriator. Um, while we don't take up and pass an AOMF or refine it with any regularity, we do fund the entire Department of Defense uh, every year. And so um, one of the ways in which Congress can and should send signals about our priorities in terms of um, security and values around the world, how we spend money on development, diplomacy, and defense um, speaks volumes. And I am hopeful um, that in this period when we have a president who is um, well-grounded in foreign policy, a skeptic of, as you put it, endless wars, uh, but who is taking his time to re-examine the consequences uh, of a precipitous withdrawal from Afghanistan, that we in the Senate will do our part too. Thank you for that. One last question for both of you. And I actually wanna go back to comments you've both made. Senator Shaheen, you talked about authoritarian regimes. Senator Coons, you talked about extremism. And Senator Shaheen, you rightly pointed out that authoritarian regimes often the, you know, one of the hallmarks is that they don't recognize uh, when they make mistakes or they don't recognize. And so as a result, you have populations that are resisting these authoritarian regimes within those countries that have been driven underground, right? So you've got this very vibrant and robust underground often feminist movements, um, a series of transnational social movements underground that are fighting back against authoritarian regimes. We see this, for instance, in Iran, right? Very powerful underground movements that are, are, are resisting against um, authoritarian regimes. How can the United States support um, some of these underground movements uh, as they seek to you know, uh, uh, push back against extremism and authoritarianism? Well, certainly a number of our democracy building initiatives are important to support civil society efforts, um, but also just to recognize what's going on. I had the opportunity a month or so ago, well, no longer than that, but to be part of uh, a forum with some women from Belarus and it's women there that are really leading the opposition um, in that country to recognize their efforts and to applaud what they were doing and to talk with them about what kind of support they need. And I think listening to uh, the people who are part of those movements, talking to them, um, giving them our support and, um, and trying to encourage what they're doing. That said, we also have to be careful about that because I'm old enough to remember um, when Russia, when the Soviet Union moved into Hungary in the 50s, and when they moved into Czechoslovakia in the 60s, and the people who were part of those movements were looking to the West to provide additional help. And we did not provide, we did not live up to the promise that they felt that we had made to them. So we have to be be careful about the kind of promises that we made. I'll tell you, I had a chance to meet with Syrians back in at the start of their uprising in 2012, early 2012. And I remember saying to them, um, you know, once, once we get through this election, um, the United States is going to step up. We're gonna provide some additional help to all of you as you're trying to take on Assad. 
And we didn't do that. And so I think we've got to, we need to provide encouragement, but we've got to be realistic about what we can do to support some of those movements. It, it was um, in the company of Senator John McCain um, that I also had a, a visit uh, with a group of Syrians, much as Senator Shaheen is describing. And one of the things about John, who was a dear friend and was kind enough to include me in some of his codels overseas, one of the sort of hallmarks of Senator McCain's um, work and travels around the world was that wherever possible, he would meet with opposition um, groups and organizations, human rights activists, um, individuals uh, who'd been jailed or who were facing oppression. Um, that was really something uh, he did over and over. And uh, the Human Rights Caucus that uh, Senator Tillis and I co-sponsor, um, co-lead in the Senate is something we are trying to get officially named for Senator McCain because of his relentless work, um, lifting up voices of those uh, who are struggling against authoritarianism. Just the very last thing uh, that was happening on the floor of the Senate Thursday as we were all leaving uh, for, our, for this current recess uh, was a bipartisan pair. Um, Senator Cardin uh, and Senator Wicker were talking about, um, excuse me, Alexei Navalny uh, in Russia, um, who, as you all know, uh, was poisoned uh, with Novichok uh, by the regime of um, uh, Vladimir Putin um, and is now being tortured in prison uh, by being woken up every hour on the hour for day and day and day after after end. Um, this is something that uh, can and should be bipartisan, um, advocating for the individual cases and the collective causes of those who are um, fighting for freedom even under uh, repression, even under very authoritarian governments. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much, Senator Coons. Thank you, Senator Shaheen. Really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedules to, to spend some time with us talking about these important topics around US foreign policy. Um, I can't thank you enough on behalf of the entire McCain Institute and Arizona State University. I wanna thank you again. Um, and until we meet again, hopefully next year in Sedona. Well, thank you, it's been an honor and what a wonderful way to continue to remember Senator McCain. Absolutely. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, Senator. Great being on with you both. Thank you. Thank you.